Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Good morning. This is Michael Waits from ATP Stories. I'm joined this morning by Steve Okun, the Vice Chairman of Asia Pacific Council of American Chambers of Commerce. And there's so many other ways we could probably describe Steve, but I'll let him do that himself. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Thank you. You're, Looking forward to our discussion. You're in Singapore, right? Yes. Okay. Look, the first thing I want to cover, and we spoke about it a little bit earlier before we started taping, is I want to talk about the article that you wrote um, in the Straits Times. We can go through that just a little bit because I want to get a sense for you're a UVA guy through and through, and UVA is in Charlottesville, if my knowledge serves me correctly. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the events of, is it last weekend or is it two weekends ago? Time seems to pass in a continuum that I don't seem to understand anymore. Yeah, no, it was about a week and a half ago. Okay, so why don't we run through that a little bit, and then we can talk about you know trade and finance and you know international business and sort of social invest, social investing, impact investing, and things like that. If, if that's okay with you. Sure. Well, I mean, you know, my background is is one of of, of government and politics. I mean, right. I worked in. Uh, you know, back in, in 92, I worked on the Clinton campaign uh, and then um, went to the White House and, and served in the Clinton administration for five years before coming to business and, and eventually coming to Singapore in 2003. So my background's always been kind of a mix of law, policy, uh, politics, and press. And, you know, going back, even, you know, starting in really 2008, you know, I, I do a, some public speaking, usually around elections, uh, because there's always a fascination uh, of the U.S. political system out in Asia. And then also because what happens in the U.S. drives what happens everywhere in the world. So it's sure. very important to, to know uh, what's going on for, for the people outside of the U.S. And uh, so everything I did back then has now just been amplified. And with President Trump and the Trump administration and the massive change that he's undertaking in direction of foreign policy, of trade, of everything else, is just so much more interest in what's happening. So I've been doing a lot more speaking lately on on the US political situation. And I was speaking at the Singapore Press Club on Thursday okay. and the they asked me uh they didn't realize I'd gone to UVA and gone to Charlottesville, you know, right. and this was right after uh you know the terrible events there. And so we started talking about that quite a bit and the head of the uh, uh Singapore Press Holdings asked if I'd write an op ed about about Charlottesville and UVA and what it meant to me and and, and to tie it into Singapore. And so uh, did that and have had a, a, an amazing response, uh, both from people here and from people back home. For people that haven't read the article, and I've obviously read through it, do you want to give a little bit of context? I mean, this whole context of, you know, do we have a Malaysian prime minister? How do we control people's perceptions of, uh, let's just call them minorities for lack of a better term? And if you have a better term, please insert it for me because this is not my bailiwick by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm just really curious how you see that in the context of what's going on. And also really interested in not just Charlottesville for what happened there in particular, but the more general terms and how the U.S. is perceived and how all those things have changed. As you said, the U.S. has a gigantic impact on events in the world, whether we like it or not, and actually whether other people like it or not. Can you, can you just sort of get into a little bit more detail about how that has changed and how the perception has changed and how President Trump has changed the way people perceive you know, America's position. Sure, I'm not sure how much time we have I got to plenty cover of all of that. I've, I've got pl but you understand the point, right? In other words, the article that you wrote in the Times know. is really yeah. interesting. Uh, no, I mean, but there's a yeah, larger I, question. So, no, I was just, just from sort of the article. So the article, what, what I wanted to do was to get a sense of the, the pride uh, that people have uh, in their schools back home, and certainly the, the pride that I have in, in the University of Virginia. So, right. so part of it was that I wanted to show the the pride of that we have as graduates of UVA. And to do that, you really have to go back and give a little bit of the history that the school was founded by Thomas Jefferson, and then you have to explain a bit who Thomas Jefferson is. Uh, you know, to the readers here, you know, they would certainly know him as the third president, but they wouldn't know him necessarily as the author of the Declaration of independence they wouldn't know that he, he he created the words all men you know wrote the words all men are created, created equal. equal 
and that there's also a little bit of debate going on, you know, in, in, you know, what is the legacy of someone like Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the words, all men are created equal, yet owned slaves himself, um, and, yet, and didn't even free his slaves when he died, unlike George Washington. And, and so to give a sense of, 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 of the history of the school, how the school has handled that, how, how we've gotten to where we are um, in, in UVA and Charlottesville, and then... Uh, to also show that the people who came were not from there, um, you know, the, the KKK and, and the neo-Nazis who marched on the lawn, who marched on the rotunda, who, who went to Jefferson's statue in front of the rotunda, which is the, the centerpiece of the university that he yes. created uh, 200 years ago, um, that those weren't people that, that anyone should have, 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 have wanted to march with, whatever your political position is. And so I wanted to get that sense out. And then to contrast, uh, because you need to bring this into the, the Singapore audience, and so I, I needed to figure out what the hook was for what happened there to explain it in the context of here. And I debated whether or not to make that hook the First Amendment, uh, which is different in the U.S. than it is in Singapore, or to make it race. And I thought that, well, I don't have the... I don't think I have the right or really the ability to contrast race relations in, in Singapore versus the United States. I can certainly see the words that President Trump used, and I can see the words that, that President, that Prime Minister Lee has been using here when, when talking about race, and, and they're very different. And so that's what I wanted to, to get at in, in the article for the Singapore Reader. Really interesting. And do you have an idea about why the people went to UVA and Charlottesville? I mean, as you said, Jefferson, as a founder and a writer of the Declaration of Independence, and the man who wrote the words, all men are created equal, why would they choose to go to Charlottesville and march on UVA as opposed to picking any other particular place in the Confederate South, if that's a fair thing to ask? If it's not, please let me know. No, no, it is. And, 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 and the reason it, it, it had nothing to do with UVA or Jefferson while they, why they were in Charlottesville, there's a, a debate going on in the U.S. right now about the appropriateness of statues in, 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 in public places to, to Confederate generals um, and Confederate leaders, so the, the, those who, who fought for and led the South um, in the Civil War. And what is it that those statues represent, and, and do they represent how do they represent to the whole community? And Charlottesville has a statue of Robert E. Lee, who, who led the Confederate Army, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the city, a, in a park, and the, they had voted, yeah, they voted to take that down, but under, under Virginia law, there was a six month period of there's a review of whether it should be taken down and where should it go. And so that's been, that time lag has, has given the ability for, for, for protesters, and I, I really don't even want to use that word, but, no, but we'll, we'll, we'll be generous for now, for, for protesters to, to say we're going to come there and protest because we have a live issue. So it could have been anywhere in the South. Um, where there were Confederate statues, and then there was time for people to organize. And so it just it happened to be Charlottesville for that reason uh, in this instance. Okay. Look, I honestly feel like we could spend hours talking about that one particular event. But you brought up another thing that I think segues, segues nicely excuse me, from that topic into just sort of the view that people have of the United States and sort of the U.S.'s involvement in global politics and global economics do you want to give a little bit of your opinion on how you see things differently, particularly coming, and I didn't know this or didn't actually think about it so much, but coming out of the sort of Clinton-Gore White House experience and volunteering for their campaigns, you fast forward to today, how do you, what do you think Trump has done to change the perception of the U.S. in, in both political and economic terms globally? Well, I, I think the, the key economic area out here, so sitting in, in, uh, in, in Singapore, has to do with trade has to do with uh, economic engagement and then how that relates uh, the economic engagement to, to political and strategic engagement in the region. And where this White House has shifted uh, almost 180 degrees from, from where almost every previous administration had been was that we need to engage in a you know, multi-party way with the entire region. And so that was really highlighted by the uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So this was uh, a, a trade agreement that was going to have 12 
countries in it, um, really with the U.S. driving the the uh, the negotiations, um, in part because uh, of of the. U.S. is the biggest market, so therefore uh, it had the the other countries, you know, wanted to get access in the greatest way to the U.S. market, but also because the U.S. wanted to put forth principles that would really move move trade uh, forward in everybody's economic interest, and so that agreement, you know, went forward. And now this wasn't necessarily a Trump thing. I mean, I mean, because you know we remember both both Trump and Hillary Clinton campaigned against the TPP that President Obama. Um, had had negotiated building upon principles from President Bush and and President Clinton uh, and even the first President Bush before him. So mm-hmm. so what's happened in the U.S. is that there has been a recognition that trade hasn't benefited everybody like it should. It hasn't benefited the workers in states like Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania that that uh, that everyone thought it was going to be. So there there has been a somewhat of a backlash against trade and in somewhat because the US government didn't do the right thing in terms of helping those workers when it comes to programs like trade adjustment authority but what president trump has done very differently is to say you know i am going to put the US first i am only going to do deals where the US is better than the other party i am only i am going to look at whether or not we have a trade surplus or a trade deficit is to d- judge whether or not this is a good trade agreement and that's very different from trying to to negotiate a win win trying to have the us being part of all of asia pacific to move things forward from a trade perspective, from an environment perspective, from a labor perspective, from a strategic perspective, and, and to do these bilateral one-offs in which the U.S. has to do better than the other side. That that has been the biggest change that uh, has been has been you know troubling. And you know, troubling is a really interesting word. Do you think it leaves a gap? And I, yes, I spend a lot of my time actually looking for gaps in market gaps, right, and try to determine how those gaps are going to get filled. Do you think it leaves a gap in global leadership? And do you think that the Chinese will come in, particularly now that they have the second largest economy um, and a fast growing economy, regardless of whether you think, you know, the banking system there is stable or whether the Chinese government is always doing the right thing or the wrong thing? I don't want to get involved in the politics necessarily, and I don't think you do either. But do you think that it leaves a, a global leadership gap? And do you think the Chinese will come in and try to fill that gap? I, I think there's way too much focus on the Chinese versus the U.S. as a result of what's going to happen under a Trump administration. And is, is the Chinese, is it, is it one or the other? Because if you look at what's happening well before uh, TPP and during TPP is you had the Australians coming in negotiating all these free trade agreements with Japan, with Korea, with, you know, the Chinese. You have the Vietnamese negotiating a, a free trade agreement with the EU. And so everybody is moving forward and everybody's going to move forward collectively. It, the U.S. isn't going to be able to dictate the terms of what's going to be in, in any trade agreement, no more so than the Chinese are going to be able to dictate the terms. And so what you have now in place of TPP-12, which was the, the, the TPP-12 countries, including the U.S., is you have the TPP-11 that could potentially move forward, where there's 11 countries saying, look, we want the U.S. in. We're better with the U.S. in. But if the U.S. isn't going to be in, then we're going to move ahead without them because uh, a, a trade agreement that addresses 21st century business issues like you know intellectual property right protection like ensuring that there are cross border data flows that 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 address all these tech issues that that aren't addressed in previous trade agreements that's worth having with or without the US and the there's another trade agreement moving forward called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that has 16 countries in it including China it is not as ambitious it is not as high level is the TPP, but it will Im- increase trade going forward. So, so everybody is trying to find the best ways to move forward together. And either the U.S. will be in it or the U.S. will be out of it. But it, it's not the U.S. versus China. Um, and I think that was a mistake that the business community made. I think it was a s- mistake that the the politicians made in 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 trying to get the TPP passed by the Congress by saying, well, if we're out, the Chinese win. Right. That that I think just that that message didn't resonate with the voters uh, in 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 Michigan or Iowa or anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's always better to say this would be better for us as opposed to if we don't do this, this will be better for somebody else. And I think the 
I think the the comments you just made are the most measured and sort of most intellectually deep comments I've heard on either side of this um, conversation. I don't want to call it an argument. What I think it also does is it sets up really nicely for the rest of this conversation because it puts into context the way, at least a little bit, the way you view not just the way the U.S. economy has its place in, in, in the global economy, but the way the rest of the world actually interacts with each other. I thought it was really interesting that you said that you know, Australia went out on their own and said if we can't have TPP-12 the way we envisioned it, we're just going to go out and negotiate our own deals with other countries and try to get the best deal you know, unilaterally, I'm sorry, bilaterally with those other countries. In a way, you know, in a exactly. Way, so Australia is doing that, right? So yeah. Australia is trying to get the TPP-11 forward, but at the same time, Australia is looking to negotiate a free trade agreement or a or or some type, not an FTA, uh, maybe a lesser one, but but some type of trade agreement with Indonesia, which is not part of of the TPP-11. And so you want to have all of those tools in the in the trade toolbox available to you. You want to have FTAs. You want to have TIFAs, SIPAs, and, 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 but you also want to have these plurilateral trade agreements. And so the Australians are doing all of that, whereas what the Trump administration has said is the only thing we're going to do is, are these bilateral um, FTAs. And I think that's, that's way too limiting for us as a, a country, and I don't think it's helping the, the U.S. business community. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's just like having one-on-one -on -one dinners with everybody as, as opposed to having a dinner party, and uh, you know, for lack of a better analogy off the top of my head. And both of those things are probably – good and viable alternatives. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that just simplifies it for people that would be listening. But I, I agree, right? There are plenty of situations where you just want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation either individually or on the nation level. But there are plenty of other times where you want to have those conversations um, in group format because it benefits a bunch of people all at the same time. And while things get more complex, the more players are involved, sometimes the outcomes are better as well. Um, do you want to talk to me a little bit about your involvement, you said, in impact investing and also just your participation in the private equity and venture capital spaces as well? Sure. And I think that's one of the things that's moving out here uh, in, you know, maybe I'll, you know, kind of bridge the, the TPP because, right, the, the TPP is the first trade agreement that really has focused not only on, on tariffs and, and, you know, rules of origin and, and things that are typical of trade agreements, but it also had chapters on the environment and labor. And, and that is something that everyone is recognizing that as business, we have to become more sustainable. Our, our trade agreements have to be more sustainable, and we have to be more sustainable as, as businesses. And what you're seeing now really develop is bringing in sustainability to, to business, to have a focus on ESG, which is environmental social governance, and, and how you as a business operate every day to be more sustainable from that environmental perspective, from um, you know worker health and safety, or or how you 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 govern yourself uh, and 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 work within the regulatory process as a business, and, and not being just focused on CSR, which is philanthropic. And so this movement from CSR into ESG. I think is really accelerating with, for, for lack of a, a, a better term, millennials. Right? I mean, where you're really seeing now is, 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 is young people come in and say, okay, look, government has a place to solve society's problems. You know, NGOs have a place to solve society's problems. The, you know, religious organizations have a place to solve society's problems. Charities have a place to solve society's problems. But business does too. And I want to create businesses that are sustainable and profitable, but also have a social impact. And so this space broadly is, is called many different things. Some people call it social entrepreneurship. Some people call it venture philanthropy. Some people say who invest in these are, are impact investors or venture philanthropists. So, so there's, there's varying definitions. I have my own definitions. Some people don't agree with mine, and I don't agree with people uh, who don't agree with me, of course. But, <laughs> but I think the, the principle is that there is a space that's developing now that's, that's fascinating and that there's room for this to grow from the investment side, from the entrepreneur side, from a, from a capacity building side that, uh, that, that's exciting to be watching out here. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole concept, CSR, as you said, right, um, corporate social responsibility is, is more of a 
philanthropic exercise. God, I can't even pronounce that word properly, but I know what it is. Um, but I do believe you're right in that millennials are really have a feeling of this should not just be philanthropy. This should just be part of the way we live. And if business is part of our life, then it should be part of business as well. And that's where this, um, yes, this ESG really comes into play. Do you have examples and I'd love to know your opinion because you said you have an opinion on this that may, may or may not be different than other people's opinion. I'd be really curious to know what your opinion is on this. And then maybe if you have some examples you can cite where you see millennials or even anybody really just going out and saying, we're going to build a business that does X. And as part of doing that, as part of being profitable and running a business that gets to employ people and pay people, how then do we handle this ESG part of the business and how does that make us different? Yeah. So the, the, well, the first question is what, what, what do I mean or what yeah. does anybody mean when they say impact investing? Yes. And so to me, the word impact has to have some meaning in, in relation to investing. And I've talked, you know, some people say I'm an impact investor and I say, oh, well, what is your expected, uh, you know, target rate of return right. in, uh, is it for your fund? And they say, oh, well, we, you know, we aim to get a, a 20 plus percent IRR, right? They want to make more than 20% every year on their investment. And I'm like, how? No, that's not impact investing. That's investing. Right? Right. That's investing. Everybody, everybody wants to make 20 plus a year. I mean, the global private equity funds will take 20 plus a year for for an IRR. And so to me, that's not, that that doesn't mean, imp what does the word impact mean? If you are going to take a market-based return, then I don't think you are an impact investor. You may be a socially responsible investor and there may be other, other ways you want to categorize yourself, but in my definition, you're not an impact investor. For me, the word impact means that you're willing to forego some type of financial return, some type of market-based return to have an impact on society uh, with your business. So you have to be a profitable business. You have to give a return to your investors, but but you 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 establish your business in a way that, that generates an impact. And I'll give an, an example of that, please, um, in a second. And and so and then the other thing I've had people say, oh, I'm an impact investor. So oh, well, what what do you invest in? And so well, I've invested in this business, you know, and we created 200 jobs. And I'm like. Uh, every business creates jobs right. because if you don't create a job, you're not a business. So if you tell me you're an impact investor and you've created 200 jobs, it's that, that, that meaningless. You, you have to have some type of, of impact beyond creating those jobs. It, it, you had to have made some sacrifice. You had to have done something right. to make you, in my, in my definition, of an impact investor. So the, the first uh, business that uh, I worked with, and, and this was when I was with KKR and, and we set up a, a capacity building program um, to help social enterprises get investment ready so that they could then attract impact investors, um, is a company called East Bali Cashews. And, and East Bali Cashews was created in a, a poor remote part of Bali. And the the, the entrepreneur there, a uh, 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 Aaron Fishman. Um, so Aaron was living and, and working in, in these villages in Bali with an NGO, and he saw that um, there was an opportunity to create a business uh, because these these villages had basically no employment other than the the the, the you know the small farmers right. that were there, uh, and. He said, well, the cashews which are grown there, what had happened was you have traders coming up from, from Sarabaya, right, buying the cashews from the farmer, shipping them to India and Vietnam uh, for processing, and then they may even go to Malaysia for flavoring and packaging, and then they might come back to Indonesia and be sold there. And Aaron said, well, this is crazy. If you can do – build the factory here in the village, put the processing here, you will cut out the middleman. You'll, you'll, you'll cut out all the logistics costs. So you'll make money and you'll create jobs where there are no jobs. And, and that is the, the, the thesis behind East Bali Cashews. And what makes him, right, a social enterprise and what makes the people who worked for, who invested behind him, impact investors, is that he could have done that very thing, but put the factory in a city. Right, put the factory in Denpasar, Sanur, or, or somewhere where where the cost would have been lower, the logistics cost would have been lower, the employment would have been easier um, to get. But he said, I'm going to increase my costs by putting by building a factory from scratch, having it in the middle, literally in the middle of nowhere. So my costs are going to be much higher in terms of logistics, or if I ever need spare parts, and I will forego revenue to do that because I want to create jobs where they're most needed. And that's what makes him a social entrepreneur. And that what, what, what makes the people who invest behind him impact investors because they know he's not, 
he is not profit maximizing. Um, they make, they, they're, they're doing very well. They're generating a lot of revenue and, and the investors have done well. Um, so they have a good return. But what they're doing it is in a way to, 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 to have that social impact. That's actually fascinating. I mean, like you said, it's so much easier to build a factory in the middle of a city. You, you know, your logistics costs are de minimis in relation to what they would be if it's in a remote part of Bali. Merely getting it from whatever sort of mountainous part of Bali he's in just to a port to then be able to ship it anywhere else where those products are going to go, in this case the cashews, means that, like you said, from a social impact investing standpoint, he's giving up a lot of revenue actually and a lot of return for his investors. So how do you how do you find or how did he go out and find people to invest in that business? What were their expectations and and then does the business go out and raise more money as it continues to grow? Does it expand outside of the one area where it is in Bali? Like what's the future for a company like East Bali Cashews or does it stay as is? Yeah, no, I mean, and, and this is a, a little bit of a challenge that really successful social enterprises have. I think what I've learned in um, working with, with social enterprises and having I- impact investors come in, every investor basically has, has, has you know, three questions. I mean, one question, obviously, what is, you know, what is the return on my investment going to be? Uh, what is your business model? What is your revenue plan? What type of capital structure are you going to put in place? So any, anything a normal investor would, would, would say. The second thing is they want to know what is the social impact. Right. Um, and, and you would typically do, you know, what's the social return on my investment in addition to the financial return on my investment. But what goes into that, that first question is, is the business scalable? Because you're not going to make a return if it's not scalable. I mean, that, that, that's that holds for any investor. Right. And so that's the key question for, for every investment I've worked on the, the, in helping these social entrepreneurs is, is the business scalable? And if it's not, then, then they're not going to get the investment. And right. they may get some money, uh, but, but they're not going to really be able to grow. And so what you know, East Bali Cashews has been able to uh, to do is it's now not just selling cashews, but it's, it's transforming itself in a way and it's um, becoming, you know, both snack foods and cashews. So that's opening up new markets. It's, it's, it's creating much more growth and, and, and opening up, you know, new lines of business and they can open up new factories and they can go to different islands and, and incorporate their techniques. So, so that is a very scalable business. And what he's been able to do is, is raise revenue. You know, the, the, the first investors were basically friends and family, you know, his father, his credit card debt, and, and to get a, you know, I'll, I'll put in air quotes, a factory built, you know, for right. about $180,000. Uh, but then the next round, which is the one that, that KKR helped him with working with uh, Impact Investment Exchange here in Singapore, the next round was, was 900000 in capital, 300000 in, in equity, and 600000 in debt. And then the next uh, uh, investor came in, I think, with about one and a quarter million and then another one and a quarter million came and then more money's coming in so it's really you know because now it's a very good business uh with a good track record it's it's much easier to to raise capital so this is interesting i was going to ask what the if you could characterize the types of investors but just dropping kkr in the mix really changes the tenor of my question right because then it gets back to falling into you know it's not csr right because it's not philanthropy at any level considering that they are generating a return um, I was more interested in sort of the follow-on investors then. In other words, how do you convince people where there's a cost of allocating capital, right? In the sense that um, I can either invest in business A or business B. And if, I'm, if I have a fiduciary responsibility to create the best return, how do I substitute some of that best return for the social impact that it's having? And then if I back up, what's the process that I need to go through to convince my LPs if I'm sitting in an LPGP structure to convince them that they're going to forego, like you said, a little bit of an economic return to have a social impact and yet still be able to earn a decent, slightly below market level return. So how do you convince the LPs to come in and say the social impact you're having is as important as the financial return you're earning and you're going to give up some of your financial return to do some of this, right? From KKR's perspective, I completely understand that. But if you back up to other investors or sort of go slightly higher, how do you convince them? What's that process like? Okay, so two, so two different things. Let me go, just do, do back a bit. And so, so, so KKR did not invest a penny in East Valley ah, Cash. Okay, sorry, so I misunderstood. What, what, yeah, so what we wanted to do in this project, and this is when I was working with Impact Investment Exchange. So, 
So the, the KKR's involvement with East Valley Cashews was our CSR, KKR CSR, right? I mean, so this was philanthropic on behalf of, of KKR. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to do a philanthropic project that generated the greatest social impact. And the way that you generate, if you're a business, the way you generate the greatest social impact through CSR is using your business skills. Sure. Right. So, I mean, if, if so, if you're a, a group of investors and you go up and clean out a river uh, for a, a you know a weekend or, or what have you, I mean, that's great. I mean, the river's going to be cleaner, but you know anybody could do that. There are very there aren't a lot of MBAs out there and a lot, not a lot of professional investors out there who could help social entrepreneurs get investment ready. And so, so what what IIX and 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 and, and KKR wanted to prove was that. What is lacking in this space of impact investing is not capital. There are a lot of impact investors out there, and it's not social enterprises. There's, there's some errands out there, and it's a little bit unique, but there, there's a lot of social entrepreneurs out there. But the problem is the social enterprises aren't investment ready. They don't know what type of capital they need. They can't even write a business plan for the most part, right? right? That, that, right. That, that, that would pass muster with any investor. And so what KKR and IAX did is said, we're gonna, we want to prove the concept that what's lacking in this space is capacity building. And so KKR did the capacity building in terms of the, the business plan revenue model capital structure for East Valley Cashews. IIX did the social impact assessment. And then um, once you get that ready, you find the impact investors. So the impact investors have already made the decision. They've said, okay, I'm going to, I have so much money to invest. Some of my money I want to get invested at a, at a, at a market return, whatever that may be, right? Mm -hmm. If it's private equity or is it debt or is it real estate, whatever, whatever return you want in that, in that pool of capital. But they said, I want to allocate some pool of capital to impact investing because instead of giving it maybe to a, a, an NGO, instead of maybe giving it to a charity, I can invest in a business that's going to create jobs and I'm going to get a return. Now I'm not going to get, the, the, the return on a venture capital investment or an angel investment that you would normally do with a, a company the size of East Valley Cashes. But I am going to get some return and I'm going to generate a great deal of social impact. So the LPs or investors have to have, to have that mindset already. To begin with. Um, and then what, to begin with. And what groups are trying to do is show investors why it is they should have that mindset. And that's the challenge right now right, right. That, that, that is out there is how do you convince people um, to do this instead of just giving your money to an NGO. And so it's, what you want to say to people is don't only give your money to NGOs and only to, to, to uh, private investment firms you know, or private equity firms or whatever it may be. Why don't you give a little pool of your money to impact investing? So isn't this, and, and again, this is a thought that I've had for a while but have not been able to properly enunciate, and that is, isn't this kind of the future of charity to a certain extent? In other words, instead of giving, right, because people always want to take some of their excess capital, excess earnings, and, try, and give it away, right? You see the Gates Foundation do this in, in an incredible way. But people have all this excess capital. It, it, it makes sense, and I think it's kind of the future of the way people will get helped is putting it through a social impact business or any business really and then going out and creating jobs and if you do it in an ESG way creating you know you're creating better things for the world through better environment and better social better social responsibility but like you said anybody can go out and create a business in 200 jobs but that's not social responsibility because you're not necessarily creating a factory in its most difficult spot like East Bali has done to me this seems like the fu like the future of investing and the future of charity sort of converging into this ESG concept is that, is that and, a fair and, and, characterization? It, it is, but it's difficult. And, and sure. I'll give you the, the, the next example that I'm working on with, with Aaron in East Valley Cashews. So Aaron has, you know, creates East Valley Cashews, and, and you know, it's in Desaban, this right, remote village. Mm -hmm. And Aaron says I, the, the, the social impact of East Valley Cashews is extraordinarily powerful, but it's extraordinarily concentrated. Right. And you literally can count the people who benefit from it, right? It's the women who work at the factory. It's their direct families. It's, he's, he's built an early learning center. It's the first you know, early childhood education in the village. So it's the kids who go to the school that, that, that's part of the factory. And it's about 600 people. But the village is about 12,000 people. And Aaron says, well, I don't want to only impact 600 lives. I want to impact 12,000 lives. Now, how am I going to do that? There is no business that you can really create to impact those 12,000 lives because the only way you're going to impact the 12,000 lives is to raise the, the revenue of, of the farmers. 
so you you have to get them more more money and and th- there's two ways to raise the revenue of the more farmer of the farmers you can either increase the yield off their existing crop or you can give them additional high value add crops to grow beyond beyond the cashews and there's no business that's going to do one of those two things so what Aaron has said is okay, the way you do that, I mean, you bring in seedlings, you bring in new growing techniques, you, you do experimentation with um, hibiscus or, or honey or, or different, different type, types of high value crop, but you need money to do that. So Aaron said, I'm going to create a venture philanthropy that is going to do this. And so a venture philanthropy, right, if you, so in, 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 in my definition, right, the venture is equal to the enterprise. It's a for-profit business. But the philanthropy is that instead of having investors, like you have an investor in East Valley Cashews, you have a philanthropist who gives money to this for-profit or revenue-generating enterprise, um, and that's why it's a venture philanthropy. And so what he's created is something called the Eco Camp at East Valley Immersion. So he creates this Eco Camp. Um, it's it's a it's a bunch of TPs right that are are in about a kilometer away from the the factory in this in this beautiful part of Bali, and it's aimed at school kids and business groups and eco tourists. And so they'll go to this Eco Camp, and the revenue generated by the Eco Camp will cover the operating costs of the Eco Camp, but the Revenue above and beyond the operating costs can then be used to to farmer education, buy new trees, right? Bring in bring in better bring in people to teach them how to how to increase their yields. Do experimentation and and give them additional ways to to grow crops that add greater value. Right. And so that's a venture philanthropy. So you need people to donate money to that business. So they're not getting a return. And so you have impact investment, you have venture philanthropy. Both of those are very possible. The struggle that we have had in raising funds for this venture philanthropy is that people who give money away want to know that it's going to go for good for sure. And the problem is you don't know that this venture is going to work. And so they say, well, you know what, I'd rather give the money to the Red Cross, or I'd rather give the money to Community Chester, I'd rather give the money to Cancer Society, because I know it, even though it won't have the impact that venture philanthropy will have in eco, at the eco camp, but it's guaranteed. And so it, it's tough, but I do think we're moving into that venture philanthropy in addition to impact investing. So I have a I have a question there as well, and this whole concept of venture philanthropy and impact investing, obviously, and venture philanthropy, obviously, a new concept introduced today to me, but very interesting, right? Um, but I'm not convinced, and so convince me, but I don't think you you want to either that you know the cancer society or that the Red Cross is necessarily going to have the level of impact that most people that give to those um, charities, which are doing incredible work. I don't want to minimize that at any level. But, you know, what does a dollar spent on the Red Cross generate in impact as opposed to what is a dollar – and and what's the guarantee? And what does a dollar generate for, you know, the Echo Camp <laughs> going to generate? And, and how, do you, how can you guarantee that either – like, to me, if you're a philanthropist, it's interesting that you want to guarantee on anything. That's just an interesting concept to me. In other words, I'd frankly, with excess capital, and I want to create as much excess capital as humanly possible to do just that, to give it to venture philanthropy so that Aaron can create eco camps on every island and every remote part of Indonesia because that's where the real impact is going gonna, is gonna to happen, I think. I think, the, to me, the era of giving money to the Red Cross is slowly but surely moving into more things like the eco camp because it has a more direct impact on individual people that I can actually see. That, that's my opinion. I'll t- I had a, a, a discussion with the head of the, uh, I think the, the, the Australian Venture Philanthropy Network. And, you know, because we, we've slowly but surely been, 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 you know, raising donations for the eco camp. But I, uh, I said to, to the head of the, down in Australia, who's, who's got years and years and years of experience in this, I said, why, what are we doing wrong? Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is taking a long time and we're not raising nearly as much and as fast as we thought we would. And he said, you're not doing anything wrong. And he goes, look, this is hand-to-hand combat raising yes. raising money for charity. And what he found, the way he described it to me, is that when you have – a venture capitalist who is going to be making a, a donation in this in this startup business, they spend months 
if not a year, doing the due diligence, right? I mean, they, they go through all the business plan. They go through, you know, they interview the, the, the entrepreneur. They want to know who his team is going to be. I mean, so the due diligence they spend on a venture capital investment is, is extraordinary. But you have no time basically to do due diligence on a, on a philanthropic donation. And so what happens is that, as, 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 as my friend described it, brand replaces due diligence or be, the brand name becomes your due diligence. So you say, right. well, look, this eco camp could work, but I don't know. Look, I've never been there. Right. He has no tracker record in this. I'm not, I don't have time to go through all this planning. I know the money I give to the cancer society is going to make some difference. Right. Fair enough. And, uh, or I know the money I give to the Red Cross is going to make some difference. And therefore, yeah, good concept, really interesting. I don't have time. Just give it to the brand name. And that's the real challenge you have uh, when it comes to this. I, I think a challenge you have when it comes to what I'm defining as venture philanthropy, which is how do you um, – how do you, how do you get funded and, and how do you convince people to fund? So does Aaron? Uh, no, just one other, so go ahead. I no, just, in, it, it, just one other short. And then the other the other challenge we've we've faced on on getting funding for the eco camp is you know you you go to these you know you go to foundations and say okay tell me about this eco camp. Well it's okay it's it's um, so the eco camp is going to serve uh, you know these you know students from you know, the United World College in, in, in Singapore, mm -hmm. or, you know, Hong Kong International School, or Jakarta International School, wherever they say, and they say, well, wait, I'm giving a donation so that kids from international school can go to a camp. Like, well, no, because what's going to happen is then they're going to pay the money, and then the money that, that they've paid will then run the eco camp, which means that people will have jobs at the eco camp they won't have jobs before, and then the profit above that will go to farmers. They say, they say wait a second, I'm, I want to help kids. Why am I helping farmers? And, and so it doesn't fit into one neat box, right? Right. And so yeah, people say, "Well, I want to do ag." You know, they say, well, "I want to give a donation for for, for you know sustainable agriculture." Say, so, "Okay, we'll give to the eco camp." Like, what does that have to do with sustainable agriculture? I say, well, I wanna, "You know, I want to give a donation to, for kids." Okay, well, give to the eco camp. But but wait a second. But the money's going to farmers, and so it's a it it doesn't fit the mold that you have today. So it's a. Uh, it's it's it'll it'll get there eventually i think as venture philanthropy takes up because for all the reasons you said um it's a natural fit but it's 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 early days and it's a it's a, a lot of struggles that that and we're learning a lot of lessons just in in, in our little project for sure so does that so does aaron go out and rebrand i mean just based on what you said does he go out and rebrand the eco camp as the east bali cashew eco camp in the sense that if the due diligence as you say is the brand then the brand of East Cashew, you know, East Bali Cashews, and, and I'm not telling you, I'm not being prescriptive, I'm just thinking out loud, right? In other words, if that's the brand, then, then that seems to me to be the best way to disintermediate the necessity for this year-long due diligence, but also the confusion around, am I helping children, am I helping smallholder farm, what am I really doing? And I think, actually, this is my opinion, you haven't asked me, but I'm gonna say it anyway, this is really my problem with venture capital on the whole, and that is, are you really a risk taker in the true tradition of venture capital, or are you trying to sort of bring, you know, listed market diligence, in other words, all of the information that a listed company is required to have today into a space where those companies may or may not even have the ability to produce that information so you can make an investment with a guaranteed return, which is antithetical to me to what a venture capital investment is supposed to be. If you think about, you know, Steve Jobs walking into, I'm guessing, is it Sequoia Capital? I can't remember even what it was in 1975 or 1976 and saying, I'm going to put a computer on every desk and then I'm saying, what am I investing in again? Am I investing in desks? Am I investing in chips? Am I, I don't understand. But they were like, okay, wait, this is, this is powerful because it's world changing in the same way that what Aaron's doing, and I am making the equivalency, right? In the same way that what Aaron's doing is world changing too. And I don't care frankly, whether I'm investing in smallholder farmers or allowing wealthy parents in Singapore to send them kids to send their kids to a camp because that money is then going to get reinvested in the local community to make the lives of those farmers better. That's my view. So in a certain sense, I think venture capitalists, at least regionally, again, my view, have become lazy in their necessity to take year to do year long due diligence in something where they're meant to be risk takers. You expect a 35% percent 
IRR, you need to be taking some risk. Excuse me. No, no, I mean, I think, and, and the challenge that you have, though, is, is when you set up these venture philanthropies, it, because if, if you, you, know, you tie it into the business, then it's not a charity anymore, Correct. right? And, and, and so, the, the, so, so if, you, if it becomes East Valley Cashew's eco camp, then, then, it, then it is a business. Uh, and it's part of East Bali, and then people aren't venture philanthropists anymore, they're impact investors, and so you do want to draw a very solid line between the two, but then you want to show, a, and, and then you want to show a relationship. Right. Uh, so it, 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 the, 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 you're seeing more of this, but I mean, I think the whole you know, risk, reward, and due diligence makes venture philanthropy an even greater challenge in terms of raising capital than impact investing. Um, uh, impact investing, you're, you know, you're, you're, the one, what do you mean by impact? Two, what is your r- rate of return that you're expecting? And then three, as you scale up, uh, how, how do you continue to generate impact? Um, because as you, as you modernize, your, 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 your impact is going to go down. And so Aaron's solution to, to solving that problem is to create a, a venture philanthropy that will will bring greater benefit, but not directly related to East Valley Cashews as a business. So, and, and this is, and I say, this is a, a, a great case study for both of these, but you know, you know, there, these types of, 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 of entrepreneurs are all over Southeast Asia. And what's, I think the most interesting and impactful thing of why Southeast Asia is probably the hottest place for, impact investing in venture philanthropy is that so little money goes such a long way, right? I mean, Aaron was able to build a factory for $180,000 to employ 100 people. Right. If you wanted to build a factory to employ 100 people in the United States, it's going to cost you a little bit more than $180,000. <laughs> Probably. And, and you don't mean $185,000. Um, yeah, when you say Aaron a little bit came, more. It, Aaron came to me when, when, when you know, we had finished uh, helping on the uh, – East Valley Cashews, and then he said, I want to, you know, build an early learning center uh, that attaches to the factory, but he goes, do you know any U.S. foundations who will be able to fund this? And I said, okay, well, well what do you need? And I, he said, well, I want to build a school that, that can, can accommodate 60 kids, and so I need to get, you know, you know a building, a structure that will accommodate 60 kids, and then we're going to need to uh, hire six teachers, uh, one of whom we will hopefully can teach English, and then we're going to need to train those. And, I, and he said, okay, so to hire the six kids and build the school, for, for hire the six teachers, build the school for 60 kids, I'm going to need about $32,000. Right. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I don't, I don't think we need a foundation to raise $32,000 for a one time. Well, so that, but that, uh, that's the other question I was going to ask is if the school costs, you know, $32,000 to fund and to build for a one time investment, what is the Eco Camp cost to build? And then what do we do better to help? Right. So again, and the whole point of this conversation, the reality is the whole point of ATP stories is, is how to get this message out to a wider audience, right? In other words, I've never heard of Aaron. I've never heard of East Bali. I've never, I mean, I've heard of East Bali, but I've never heard of East Bali cashews. And I didn't know he was building an eco camp or building an early learning center. So, So I guess the question for me is now that I know all of this, Right, like you said, thirty-two thousand dollars to build the camp. What does that cost? And how much money are you trying to raise? And why has that been so hard? You've already addressed it a little bit, but there's got to so be the camp, there's got to be somebody in the yeah. world who has the hundred grand to be able to fund that. Yeah. So, so the eco camp, the original budget was to 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 get it up and running at full speed would have cost about I think, we think three hundred thousand dollars basically okay. and then when you had three hundred thousand dollars in the bank you'd have had it up and running uh, for good and that it would you would never have had to raise a penny again because it would have generated the the revenue to cover the operating costs uh, and would have would have then been able to use the rest of the money above and beyond that for the programming for all the the farmer education and in and, and giving you know scholarships to, to to women who typically don't go to, to school beyond high school in that village right. the, the, the boys sometimes do but the women usually don't and uh, so basically when we hit about Fifty to sixty thousand. Aaron said, "Okay, I've got enough to start. Let's get it started, and then let's get it going. And then, hopefully, as people come and we'll learn about it, we'll we'll be able to to do more." So the the camp, the people stay in teepees. 
And like you know, back mm-hmm. in the uh, you know U.S. Uh, mm-hmm. time, uh, so each TP basically costs about you know two thousand twenty five hundred dollars to build, and so you can build them out 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 as you need them. And so, for about fifty or so, you're able to get it up and running. And so now, if you you'll go on, if you Google you know East Bali immersions and uh, and look at the Eco Camp, you'll you'll see people are coming there now. School groups are starting to go there now. Um, I told. Uh, the private equity club at INSEAD, which is, you know, a, a, yes. a, an MBA school here in Singapore about it. They've sent, they sent people out there. Uh, KKR was the very first guest there. We had a, an offsite there, uh, uh, back in February. So we were the, the, the ones to, to open it up. Uh, so people are starting to come. It's starting to generate some revenue. And so slowly, slowly, slowly it'll, it'll get built up. But yeah, a, a donation. Of you know a hundred or two hundred thousand now will then will then get it at, at absolute you know maximum capacity uh, in terms of of all the the money that'll ever need to get raised and so I, it is it's finding ways to tell the stories it's going you know it's 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 you know you know working with people like you or it's 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 going to conferences and um, and doing articles and and uh, but it's it's getting people there and getting them to tell the stories and and then getting people to understand what venture philanthropy is but different people. Have different definitions of venture philanthropy. Some people, they say I'm a venture philanthropist, but I want my money back at the end. So then I can go donate it, and I put the air air, air quotes donate because you're getting your money back. Right. I can then go donate yeah. it to somebody else. So for f- some people, venture philanthropy is that they don't make money, but they don't lose money. Now my definition is if you're a philanthropist, then then you're giving your money away. But other people look at it differently, and so there's debates about what venture philanthropy means. There's debates about what impact investing means. There's debates over what's the definition of a social enterprise. Uh, so it's all 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 you know. But that's what makes this space so fun right now. Yeah, I was going to say this is actually the perfect place to end, if you don't mind me saying. I mean, just only because it leaves only because it leaves so many other open questions, and it gives me an excuse to get back to you and say, "I have questions on this and questions on that." As this space continues to develop, and hopefully, you'll become a resource, you know, not just for us but through us to be able to continue to tell these stories. I mean, I'd love. I, I'm I'm going to ask you. I would ask you offline, but I want to ask you online. Mm-hmm. I'd love to be introduced to Aaron, to be able to talk to him for an hour, if not more again, to be able to help him tell his story and whether that actually ends up in raising money for the East Bali immersion or just gives more coverage to the East Bali cashews and all the work that he's trying to do there, that would actually be something that would be really important and really close to me. Um, well, let's, we'll get you out to Bali and you could, you could do a remote podcast. It would be perfect. Yeah, I mean, we, as you know, and again, not to talk about us because it's very difficult to talk about yourself after talking about this for almost an hour, but you know, we are going on the road and that's going to be part of what we do is go to remote places to try to find out from people exactly why they're doing what they're doing in the place that they're doing it, right? It's very easy for us to sit here, wherever here is. For me, it's Bangkok and for, and for Graham, my partner, it's in Tokyo. And it's very easy for us to sit here and pontificate about what we think is going on. It's so much more powerful, I think, to actually go to that place and actually talk to the people there and find out exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it there. Yeah, no, I, and 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 to to speak to the people who who you know the managers who are from the village and who 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 whose families have been in the village for generations and you know Neoman and 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 Neoman, Made and, yeah. and and and, and, yeah. and uh, who are who are you know the managers of the factory and who are really making you know building you know the eco camp at the same time they're running the factory and what they're trying to do for the farmers and it's an amazing place to visit uh, to see the transformation that is occurring and to see the from the school and the workers and the women and it's just the and so just the power you have in terms of social entrepreneurship and impact investing and, and venture philanthropy i mean to see it firsthand will really make you a, a, a convert into it yeah and i mean on the other and and to further that right wouldn't it make sense at some level and i'm happy i'm sure aaron's already thought about this but if there are 25 tents there 25 teepees there or more now right as you said it only takes two thousand dollars to build each one and they can be built as needed wouldn't it be interesting and maybe even powerful as well to have a real sort of venture capital conference at the camp itself and try to educate that would people? Be do, do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, talk to Aaron and say, you know, if KKR went there as sort of the opening, not sponsor, but as the opening participant mm-hmm. in the existence of the camp, wouldn't it be great to get a regional conference for uh, not entrepreneurs, but for venture capitalists to go there and to see exactly the work that Aaron's doing and the output of that work? 
And while they may or may not be venture philanthropists, wherever there's money, there's philanthropy. And if you can get sort of the, you know, whatever part of that chain is where the money gets generated or originates, then you can then have those people go out and become um, ambassadors for that East Bali immersion. It just sounds like a great idea to me, just off the top of my head. Oh, and, and, and the scenery and the food, I mean, spectacular. So we're going to hold you to this. No, please, because, no, because think about it. People, and I don't mean it in, in, a, in a derogatory way, but if you think about it, right, venture capital people go to Bali, they flock to Bali because they can stay. And I'm going to pick a place off the top of my head. I don't even know if it exists, but they can, you know, stay at the Ritz-Carlton. They can stay at Jimbalan Bay. They can stay at the Aman Nusa, whatever it is, and have a great conference. And yet Bali itself actually offers the East Bali immersion experience, which is a much, if you're going to go to Bali, why not go there and actually learn about real investing at its core? That sounds to me like a, a much better idea. And again, if, if it does nothing else, it gives exposure and coverage to the types of things that Aaron's trying to do. And, you know, shame on you if you're an investor. And isn't this what Warren Buffett did to Bill Gates so that he went out and created his foundation? If you looked yesterday, Bill Gates just gave 64 million shares to an, un, to an undisclosed group of people. And if you look at what Bill has done since he has been shamed by Warren Buffett saying, you're going to keep all that money? It's to, you know, it's, that's the wrong way to handle all of the wealth that you've generated. Give it away because once you die, it's useless. You could do the same thing in the venture capital industry in Southeast Asia. Send them to Bali, have them be at the immersion camp, and then have them rethink the way they're dealing with their excess capital in a way to reinvest it in the region that's making them so wealthy. And, and, and you know, this is a place where tourists do not go. I mean, no. it's three hours no. from, from Noosa or Seminyak, and, 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 and there's no tourist facilities up there. A couple dive resorts uh, not far away, but that's it. And so it, 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 is, a, it is a place that is, is magical that, that no one goes to. And so it would be great to have something organized like this. Let me talk to Aaron about that. Okay. Look, I'm going to – You're on. I'm, you're on. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm I, I'm happy to have the conversation, right? I make no promises, but I I will I, I do uh, try as hard as I possibly can. Look, let's end this conversation here. I really want to thank you, Steve, for spending an hour with us. And I mean, the conversation for me was fabulous and super educational. I hope it was as interesting and positive for you as it was for me. And let's just agree to get back on the phone again. I mean, we're, oh, the other thing that I'm trying to do is create sort of a stable of you know, really high level professionals who are willing to come back on the show and say, here's what happened in the last week or the last month. And here's my opinion. That's, you know, either different or the same as with the opinion I've voiced before, but now we have current events that we can comment on and that would really be useful for us. I think. And yeah, well, with the way things are going in the U S we may have to do it every day. <laughs> sure. We'll have the daily Steve show. I have no problem with that. <laughs> Thank you. Again. Any, anytime. Okay. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.